In our last video, we learned about the different types of receptor proteins. There are two basic types, ionotropic receptors and metabotropic receptors. In this video, we're going to examine ionotropic receptors in detail and try to understand how they function. Uh, you'll remember from the previous video that a neurotransmitter is released and that neurotransmitter then crosses the synapse and uh, can interact with the receptor protein. So we have the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter fits into the binding site on the receptor. Uh, and in an ionotropic receptor, what will happen is when the neurotransmitter binds with the receptor, the receptor protein itself becomes a channel, uh, much like the voltage-gated channels, only in this case the opening is not caused by a depolarization of the membrane, but is actually caused by the neurotransmitter fitting into the binding site. Once that channel is in place, then the receptor protein can allow uh, one of two things to happen. You can either have an ion enter into the neuron through the channel, or the other possibility is that an ion could exit through the channel. Now notice that uh, the receptor can do only one or the other. It doesn't allow the ion to pass both ways. And that's just like what we saw with voltage-gated channels that a voltage-gated channel would allow a specific ion to move through it and it would allow it to move in one direction only. And that's how these ionotropic receptors function as well. So, based on that, we could ask ourselves some questions about how these um, ionotropic receptors can affect the membrane potential of the neuron. The first question that we could ask would be, well, what would happen if you had some sort of positive ion outside of the, uh, the neuron, and that positive ion went into the neuron when the ionotropic receptor opened? What would that do to the membrane potential? Think about that for a moment and see if you can come up with your own answer. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at our oscilloscope again. Remember we have the positive up here, the negative here, and we'll use this line to represent equilibrium, zero. Now, if our neuron was originally at rest, about negative 70 millivolts, and we started allowing positive ions to flow in through the receptor protein, then we should see a depolarization of the membrane. And if enough of those positive ions come in, we would actually go up above uh, the, the zero mark and have the inside of the neuron become positive. But whether it goes up all that way or not, the point is that if positive ions come in, you will get some kind of depolarization. The inside of the neuron will start to become slightly positive. All right, so that's our first question. Now, our second question is similar. But this time, I want to know what would happen to the membrane potential on the neuron if we allowed a negative ion to enter the neuron. And so let's go ahead and remove these uh, positive ions and uh, put some negative ions out here. And think about it just a little bit. If these negative ions started to flow into this neuron, what would that do to the membrane potential? All right, I hope all of you have a response of some type. Let's put our oscilloscope back down here again. With our positive and negative poles. And equilibrium. Again, we start with our neuron at rest. So it has a resting potential of about negative 70 millivolts. And now we start to add negative ions. As we do so, we would cause that membrane to hyperpolarize. Because the inside of the neuron will become more negative than it was before. 
So those are the two possible effects that we can have from either positive ions entering, that's this up here, or negative ions entering, that would be this down here. Positive ions would result in depolarization, and negative ions would result in hyperpolarization. So, does this actually happen in neurons? Yes, it does. One of the more common types of um, ionotropic receptors is a glutamate receptor. Uh, I'm going to clean this image up just a little bit before we, before we go any farther. So we'll remove our negative ions and try to remove uh, the uh, arrows that I've drawn here. Okay, so we're going to say that what we're, we're dealing with now is a glutamate receptor. We'll label it. Glutamate is a very common neurotransmitter. And we'll say that this is our glutamate uh, neurotransmitter here. And when it fits down inside of that receptor protein, it causes the channel to open up like we've talked about before. And now we're going to have uh, an ion enter into the neuron and we'll use we'll use green and the particular ion that we're talking about is one that's familiar to us sodium ions will begin to enter into uh, the neuron and as they do of course they're going to cause that depolarization of the neuron so that would be an example of this first situation where we have a positive ion that's entering in through the receptor for producing the depolarization. Now, let's look at a different one. If we remove the sodium and we now have ourselves looking at a, a new neurotransmitter rather than glutamate, let's take a look at what happens with another really common neurotransmitter called uh, GABA. Oops, let's do that in our black. Okay, so you know, GABA. And um, when GABA crosses the synapse and binds with the receptor, this will be our GABA, again, we get an opening of the receptor protein. Um, this time, we're going to get a, a different kind of ion that will flow through. In this case, we have chloride, and chloride is a negatively charged ion. So as the chloride enters in through the receptor protein, we're going to see this hyperpolarization that we talked about before. So those are two examples of actual neurotransmitter systems working on ionotropic receptors and producing either depolarization, if it's glutamate, or hyperpolarization, if it's GABA. And they're good examples of, of how these systems work. In the next video, we're going to take a look at how the second type of receptor protein functions, uh, the metabotropic receptor proteins.